symbiotic communities. It's very diverse. So the looking at patterns um, of where you're working is very important. Um, just by comparison, New Jersey, uh, New Jersey has 10 biotic communities just for um, comparison. So it's a very, very diverse place to, to, uh, to work and design in. Um, not, and not to mention the um, uh, diversity of ethnic groups as well. There's uh, numerous um, tribal lands and, and the cultural conditions change a lot too depending on where you're working. And so uh, starting into, into patterns, I've already introduced that somewhat. And so what in particular um, the sort of areas do we look for um, for some of these patterns of uh, cultural, uh, you know, current and historic cultural conditions. Um, the geology, uh, very diverse, much more in this part of the country. There's a lot more, there's um, a lot more volcanics um, as opposed to compared to New England where there's a lot more, where, uh, a lot of glacial surficial geology going on. So we have, uh, and um, in general, the um, there's a Arizona's on the edge of the Basin Range province, so you have very extreme, very uh, rocky, um, highland upland conditions, and then um, alluvial uh, valleys with lots of uh, deposits of soils and gravels and rocks that way. So it's a it's you and and so that that pattern will also come into play when it comes to uh, the way moisture drains as well. So there's a lot of in some areas sheet flooding. And traditionally, before lots of erosion happened, sheet flooding was very common in the valleys. Um, and we'll get touch on that a little bit more. Hydrology, um, it just sort of speaks for itself. And the ecology varies very much from, uh, from area to area, site to site, city to city, um, based on plant types and soils and elevation. And the politics, of course, um, much more um, conservative. Um, than in the east. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. But these are all areas that are that will affect things that I keep in mind when looking for the patterns to find the best solution for. And so the um, urban concentrations are um, um, obviously everybody's familiar with with flooding, but we uh, in, in a certain area. The, um, the engineering really hasn't ever caught up. We have a lot of grade crossings of our drainages, and so you may have even heard stories in um, um, from Phoenix area where the, the actually some major highways actually have storm have grade crossings, and people get washed away, and some people even get killed in some of these storms. So the the the, the weather patterns are very different. Where there are moisture regime in the in the summer, July and August is when we get most of our rain, and they come in very intense thunderstorms, and then followed by very dry periods in the fall, and then sporadic um, storms through the winter, and then it dries up again March, April, May, June. We can go 90 or 100 days without, without moisture in that time of year. And then monsoon season hits. It's, it's what they call it here, but this afternoon thunderstorm pattern. Um, and you can get some very, very heavy uh, rainfall. And so these, um, I think there's a lot of improvements could could happen in in, in terms of in terms of the way um, engineering is looked at and, and uh, looking at watershed overall watershed work instead of just um, singular um, civil engineering problems. Um, so. Um, the, the weather patterns um, haven't changed that much, except for recently we're, it's gotten drier in the last five years. But um, historically, this I'm showing this erosion slide because um, this is a recent phenomenon, probably in the last uh, 50 or 100 years. I don't know exactly, but you can see the drainage at the bottom channel. The, the channel used to be up on that flat ground that looked it was some kind of it was uh, rangeland and it was most likely uh, mismanaged or overgrazed uh, and then which is uh, um, eroded the delicate crust of vegetation overgrazed and then through some of these m massive storms over the last hundred years like I said at the most um, 
major erosion features um, can occur. So it's very fragile. It's very fr um, fragile, and this is sort of testament to that. Um, I talked a little bit about the weather patterns already, and um, those are actually those patterns that rain that summer. A weather pattern is is fairly consistent. Um, um, pretty much from about the Colorado River um, all the way through New Mexico up into southwestern Colorado and so in Utah. So the southwest is, is uh, that's a, a fairly prevalent pattern. And so you, the, the uplands and highlands uh, are, are well, very well drained and then the um, the um, the valleys and the concentrations. This being a natural river system, but um, even side canyons and side drainages uh, where there's a concentration of moisture is very obvious based on um, the plant life that's growing there, and you can you can tell very easily um, uh, what's uh, what's going on in terms of moisture content because the surrounding highlands are so dry. In general, it's quite quite easy to read the landscape using vegetation type because it's generally so arid where there is a small concentration of water they usually um, find it fairly easily. In fact, early settlers used the cottonwood um, tree as, a, as an indicator for groundwater, potential water, even if there wasn't any surficial water there, there was a um, good chance of actually digging for water using cottonwood tree as an indicator, which by the way can in this climate can transpire about five, a mature cottonwood can transpire about 500 gallons of, of water a day. Ah, lack of will um, and cooperation. Um, this is a, sort of a, a, a political piece. There's not a lot of private-public partnerships um, going on, even though that would be really great if there were. It um, tends to be um, very very conservative, and um, uh, every, there's a suspicion, just basically a suspicion of government and cert certainly federal government and state as well. And just as an aside, uh, <laughs> the um, we we may not have a, a public education in Arizona much longer, but that's a different topic. Sorry. Um, let's say um, so. Why do I show this to you? I show this to you because, um, well, the next slide actually um, shows it alleviate even a little bit better. We have um, tend to take our culture with us, meaning that a lot of our um, uh, behaviors and uh, were, are, were brought from somewhere else. They're not actually con conducive to um, to the arid climate that I find myself working in, and so the people from the east or from Originally, our culture from Northern Europe is, is not well adapted to desert conditions, so we, we, we bring in all our, of our expectations, our cultural and um, agricultural and landscape expectations into an area and then expect it to respond the same way, and of course it doesn't. And so to, to keep that pattern going requires a, a tremendous amount of um, additional moisture, and so somewhere you've got to strike the balance between what is, what's um, what's too much and, and what's acceptable in terms of uh, project by project um, and gets right into the design details. And I like to say that I actually had the, um, had the, um, had this, uh, the United States originally been a Spanish colony, I think our landscape ethic would look considerably different than, than the, um, than the grassy than the grassy landscape that we see in most of the country. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in to uh, get into uh, passive rainwater harvesting strategies. And um, I sort of, I will talk about them in the same breath as I would um, if they were stormwater, um, passive stormwater strategies as well. I think the, the, the basic, I, the basic um, premises of, um, of slow it, spread it, and sink it in reference to water and runoff and improvement of reduction of volume or reduction of, uh, st of um, stormwater contaminants is, is the same. I think that whether they're very small, like this 
um, like this uh, curb cut uh, in Tucson and just going into a mulched rocked basin. Um, and these ideas, you know, thinking, thinking of small um, solutions and throughout and thinking like thinking like a watershed, thinking like a healthy watershed. So I think of these uh, passive rainwater strategies as very much like small and um, dispersed versions of, of large centralized uh, projects, which um, we talk about a little bit later too. Um, and uh, this is actually in the front in the street of one of my friends, Brad Lancaster, who's done a lot of work um, in Tucson on this kind of work. Um, likes to con call these uh, beneficial ruins, so meaning that with a little bit of uh, intervention, um, and if it's designed properly, that this this could be a beneficial ruin and actually contribute um, moisture and nutrients to the ecosystem for years to come without any, um, you know, any maintenance or hardly any maintenance or any gerrymandering at all. So, beneficial ruins is an interesting concept. I like to think about it that way. Um, diagram from uh, most all uh, landscapes I'll put, I'd call this bioswale, but this could also consider this a um, landscape basin so that all the hardscape is on the high ground and then these very flat, very level bottomed um, depressed basins where landscape will go so this becomes a, a self-irrigating system. Um, ideally you could improve the soil for the root zone but um, well adapted plants will adapt to um, are fairly well adapted to very dense um, soil uh, properties that we have in most in most of the projects I've worked on. Very dense uh, clay or even caliche. Um, caliche is a little hard to deal with, but that's a different story. Um, uh, so, other this, um, you know, they could be associated with soil improvements. Like I said, um, some projects will actually import granular fill. Um, in some cases, in extreme examples, I'll actually dig a uh, put in a dry well, meaning that I'll have a put a deep infiltration hole and fill it with with AB or some granular material just to get increase my surface area in the bottom if the soil is too dense. Um, contour swales and not uh, I will actually use on side slope in some cases. Um, and it you know this is the this is the cheapest, simplest way to get to get moisture into the soil so the plants so it's available to the plants. Um, Porous pavement is something I've I've worked with before, but it really doesn't work in with our um, our moisture pattern. I'd rather use hard, impervious surfaces as long as they're not too big, roads, um, sidewalks, and get and actually shed that moisture um, into the landscape where it's actually going to be more readily used and needed. Putting moisture below. Um, an asphalt or a large asphalt or plaza surface doesn't make that much sense to me. There's no, there's not enough plant life there to take advantage of it. So, this is a decision I've reached based on the, based on the, the um, distribution of plants, the way plants respond to moisture, and um, I think it works better based on a on a on a much uh, with much more drawn out, spread out, lower um, precipitation patterns. I think that. Porous pavement certainly works for. Um, I think it probably works pretty well in the Northwest, and and from the ones I've seen in Vermont, it probably works fairly well there too. But in arid climates, it doesn't. It's not worth the extra expense, and the plants don't get to take advantage of that. I've also had freezing problems with it too in the project I worked on. It's um, so. Also, we have there's. A lot of the municipalities where I work are have detention basins, and sometimes we get a chance to to modify some of these detention basins. In this case, we did a we meandered a um, it was a, a culvert which came into a detention basin, and then we meandered that stream. We actually improved the cross section with um, sandy soil, and then we had volunteers help, and we we put in it became a, a native plant habitat. Um, in fact, and we unusually. We had a feeling we might, but we actually hit groundwater in this situation. So the groundwater, once it settled, was just below the surface. The bulrushes came in on their own. Um, we seeded the thing, and it's um, so far it's it's been a pretty huge success. And of course, without compromising on the volume of the of the basin itself. In fact, we made it deeper and we increased the volume so that we could do our 
to do our um, bioremediation work. Um, soil improvements, the soils are um, uh, always a struggle here and I think it's one of the the areas that need the most, um, need to do the most work and oftentimes don't get budgeted to do that kind of soil improvement work here. Um, uh, I mean, if if I get two inches of if I get two inches of topsoil in a project, I'm fairly happy. Or I'll have to build that topsoil with by import or with with mulching and composting. Um, the soils here are extremely alkaline uh, due to the arid conditions, so we don't get as much uh, decomposition going on. So the organics are very low generally until we get a good um, natural plant cover going on, and then they can start to rebuild themselves. Um, and sometimes I'll need soils will be so inert I'll need to inoculate them with my mycorrhizal, and uh, to increase the um, to increase that. And we don't never use any chemical fertilizers. We don't do that sort of counter, you know, counterproductive to stormwater work. Okay, uh, plant considerations, um, plant selections in these uh, passive structures is critical. Um, in the, even in the slide I just showed you, there's actually just a, a, about a foot uh, above the water line, the center water line, um, I switched to upland plants, which on the left, examples of, of um, bear grass and agaves and, and native shrubs, patchy plume, things like that, that are native and adapted to the upland conditions. Um, so after a year or two of irrigation, I really don't want to, I want to pull that off and don't let those upland plants, they don't really require any, any additional irrigation after a couple of years if you've chosen the right plants. Inversely, of course, down in the lowlands you have a different plant palette completely, but um, literally even in most natural drainages, a couple feet in elevation and you'll immediately switch to, um, to the two upland plants. Um, and so whatever, it's a, and I look at it as what uh, moisture is going to be available to these plants and um, and this is where back into finished grading comes into play where even on the upland plants I'll do, I'll create basins or contour swales to capture what little runoff hits those areas um, and to, to self-irrigate those plants, at least for establishment. And um, the, the, the contouring will help them through, through the course of their life until the contours fill up with mulch or, or sediment. Um, into active strategies. Um, active rainwater I'm harvesting is something um, that I've been working on in the last 10, 10 years. Um, I actually had a, uh, nobody, I actually had to open my own company in, in Prescott, Arizona to do um, rainwater harvesting because um, nobody was picking up, not, there was not enough activity, so I actually had to start a company so we could actually get some of these things implemented. Um, and so um, rainwater harvesting, this, these are, you can do above ground tanks, below ground tanks. Um, I'm also going to touch a little bit on gray water and, um, and condensate. So I consider those uh, gray water and condensate as active strategies. Um, but there's a big difference between uh, gray water actually technically is reuse water. Uh, but rainwater is not reuse water. It's a common misnomer. It's um, it's actually a it's actually an alternative source uh, of water, of rainwater, and that um, a lot of uh, and nobody can really considers it that way. Really, the only you know the status quo is thinking of of surface water, well water, municipal water as as the really only legitimate source of water. But trying to trying to change that trying to change that language a little bit. So Southwest Wine Center, this was recently, and this was installed last summer. Um, it's a research center actually for uh, grape growing in the Verde Valley in Cottonwood, Arizona. Um, so the architect wanted to, originally wanted to actually capture um, the entire um, roof area and run all of the um, internal and external water uses off of rainwater. So it's quite common. We've done many projects where we'll actually filter it to potable quality, and then the the entire building, all the building systems, will use it. Um, so, but this got reduced, the um, because that was it's a public building, and that would require 
um, water testing on a monthly basis by the health department. That was a fee that they weren't willing to spend. So we just reduced this system back to um, just irrigating um, the landscape. Um, I'm sorry, not the adjacent grape vineyards, but the landscape associated with the building. Uh, gray water is reuse water. I covered that. Very simply, um, uh, I haven't, there's, even though gray water is uh, legal, um, Arizona and New Mexico have a very similar statute um, where they're, if you're in an unincorporated area, um, that gray water use is, uh, is completely legal and so is rainwater capture as well. Other states, um, uh, very different uh, rules and regulations. But very quickly, a diagram um, uh, below ground, two inch or half inch um, PVC or ABS pipe with a split drain. It's called a branch drain system. If anyone's interested in, gray, in doing gray water, um, they should go to Art Ludwig's books. Art Ludwig is the um, the uh, the expert on on gray water systems. So um, this is just a very quick diagram to show you how how simple they can be. And the the infiltration basin uh, chamber on the right, which is basically an upturned bucket, with the rock on the top. If you don't have enough grade to work with, you're going to have to do something like this. So we've got a little dry well situation. Um, active rainwater collection. Um, very quickly, going to go through a um, a system. I'm going to just go through the numbers here. Number one deals with the uh, the roof surface, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, number two on the gutter, you can actually put your initial um, screens there for, uh, to divert leaves and other debris from getting in the gutter. Um, and then um, we'll skip number three. Number four is a rain head where you'll put an opening at the bottom of a gutter, and you'll this is a rain head actually has a sloping screen on it so that any leaf or debris that gets on there will uh, auto, will sort of by gravity fall off the side and there's an insect screen in the bottom of that to capture even smaller material and to keep uh, mosquitoes in particular and small insects from breeding in the tank. And number five is a first flush device um, which is takes out um, even another level of, of, of sediment and contaminant. Um, in freezing climates, this is um, not worth it. It tends to cause more trouble than it's worth. I've actually taken more out than I've put in recently. Um, in lieu of, if you keep your, and with good practice, you can. You don't really need to to use a first flush device. And then that will overflow into the top of the tank. And then um, at number six and then number eight is a um, an overflow. And every tank overflows, so you have to have the same volume. Will be able to get out of the tank as fills the tank. Uh, above ground tanks are, are the most common. They're the cheapest to install, like this one shown here. Um, in, uh, and even in freezing climates, like in high elevation Arizona, I'll, I'll, um, I'll have to bury the tank at a foot or foot and a half, the bottom of the tank, so that my connections remain frost free. Um, for areas where you have even deeper frost levels, like um, I have a rainwater harvesting colleague in Minnesota, for example, which is, would be comparable to Vermont conditions. Probably try to either put um, you know, cisterns in, in, a, in a basement level or do a burial, put, put a direct burial system to get, get the components underground. If you're forced to do an above ground, you're probably going to have to come up with some behavior change, meaning you'll have to drain it during certain times of the year. Um, and most of the systems I put in are pressurized and the, with a submersible pump. Um, which protects in a large volume of, of tanks the, the thing will, will nothing will freeze in a large volume at, with the climates I'm referring to. Like I said, in northern in colder climates you'd probably want to do a direct burial of tank systems. Um, highest and best uses for rainwater. Uh, this is a good discussion for me because I think that rainwater is um, I've put in uh, potable systems, I think that's the highest and, and best use. And this, of course, these are debatable, and depending on what you're actually trying to do with the water. Um, growing food is the best irrigation water there is. And then in descending order, bathing, washing machine, landscape irrigation, fire suppression. I've done a number of systems that, in, that involve or double as fire suppression systems, especially in remote areas where fire danger is high. Um, it's great for cooling systems. It's very soft water, so you don't have lime and uh, mineral buildup. 
Um, anything else you can think of, and then last on the list is toilets. I know a lot of green buildings use rainwater to um, flush toilets with. Um, I just think it's a waste of excellent quality water to be flushing toilets with it. I know toilets are 30 percent of tend to be about 30 percent of a water uh, budget, but it's just such a shame. Um, reasons why people harvest um, rainwater. I can let you uh, read through these. While you do that, um, one thing I wanted to add to this list would is the um, that as a as a uh, volume uh, reduction for when you're dealing with um, using rainwater harvesting as a as stormwater mitigation tool, you really need to have a uh, a water use or a regime so that you're actually the the tank is you know 50 percent available for uh, you know stormwater surges. So if the tank is full or left full most of the time, um, it's really it's negligible as a a stormwater technique. So you have to use that water or make sure that the water is that you have in most cases have 50 percent or more of the volume of the tank or cistern available for for storm surge otherwise you're not going to get any volume uh, sort of mitigation qualities out of it. Catchment services there's a lot of um, a, a pre-finished factory metal roof is the highest quality one of the lowest quality you might uh, is the um, is a galvanized galvanized roof because of the amount of zinc you'll get off of that. Um, asphalt shingle roof is very common and it's actually really not bad. All the studies that um, that I've heard is the, the asphalt is is not um, that residual and it's not doesn't seem to be a problem. It, it's, um, so anyway there's a, a big long, you could go into a long detailed discussion about catchment services but I'm going to spend a little time um, doing sizing a system and talk about the variety of tanks a little bit. I think I already did a little bit. There's metal tanks, there's plastic tanks, above ground, below ground um, tanks with liners. Um, I want to just slow down here just a second and show you this um, water budget. This is, I've just developed this uh, recently. It's a case study. Upper left you can see we have a 2,500 square foot roof area. And here's our um, supply side calculation. So roof area times 0.623, that's a constant, uh, that's 1,500 plus gallons, and then multiply times the number of uh, inches of annual precip. And so at a rough number, I get 23,000 gallons a year just off a of 2,500 square foot roof, and that's only in an area that gets 15 inches of annual precipitation. Um, then I'll multiply that times a runoff coefficient, and this time I'll go 0.85, which is because um, you never get 100% of the water off the roof. 85% is probably usually the best you're going to do. Maybe 90% if it's a if it's a perfect metal roof. Usually it's lower, a little bit lower. Um, and so um, and then other other supply side waters that I can calculate in, um, which are not part of this calculation but should be considered are mechanical condensate and gray water, probably the two um, that's non non-municipal, non-articulated water supplies. So I want to go over to the um, to the right. I don't know why that went dim. Um, I do. So I wanted to go I uh, stay on um, Along the, the top line, you can see a month by month I calculated um, my the using uh, readily available rain data. The um, the top line, the top graph, shows the supply side, meaning how much uh, water captured month by month, and then based on on the demand side, on below the lines, are a constant of how much water this household is using, and then. I've also put in irrigation for vegetable garden, and so those, of course, are somewhat arbitrary. Except the fact that the 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 1050 number, 1050 gallons per month, was used. That's based on a on a 35 gallon per day um, household. Um, that's actually quite doable, but um, it might seem really conservative. But if you are if you're um, in an off-grid situation, it's it's very doable. And 
we're trying to build the case that you can live solely on rainwater, even if you're only in a, an area where you get 15 inches of rain. So, so there's the supply side on top, uh, the demand side on the bottom, month by month. And so from a tank sizing standpoint, I've, um, I've started uh, the, the vertical line called the water year, and I've started there doing calculations based on my um, take view, the amount of water I've captured, and then uh, but between November, December, January, February, March, and subtract my usage. Since those are not irrigation months, um, that's pretty much dom just domestic use. And then so up, I end up with, um, with a surplus of 3,900 gallons. Then I'll um, forward that um, to, uh, or to around the, the other side, to the left side of the chart, where then I'll do it. I'll just continue that calculation. And so the the long and the short of it is that my um, I show show my my minimum my minimum tank size as is is my largest surplus month, which is I've got show so that it's almost four thousand gallons, and then I will I've added twenty five percent percent contingency for um, for number of uses. It could be for stormwater uh, volume mitigation, or it could just be because I can actually capture that water and I'll find something to use it for and uh, maybe fire protection, maybe other things that are um, uh, for longer term use. So I've sized this system at 5,000 gallons and I still consider that a minimum and I chose 5,000 because it's the next, it's the one of the closest readily available tank sizes that's that's manufactured. So they come in 2,500, 3,000, 5,000 um, and they go up from there. You can get up to 10, but once you get above ground, um, plastic tanks above 5,000 gallons, they start. It start for larger volumes. It's probably worth looking at um, uh, alternative tanks besides above ground plastic. But moving on, um, I also this is another part of that um, um, example. I'm just gonna. I'm not really gonna spend any time on this. Just to show you that I've done um, case studies on how to. Um, how to create a net zero off-grid uh, property just using rainwater alone. If anyone has any questions on this, ask me later. I want to move on to the case studies here. Um, okay. Uh, Northern Arizona, uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, 7,000 feet. Um, here's some of the quick credentials on this on this project. First lead platinum building in Arizona. Um, so our problems were uh, this was built um, on a regional stormwater detention basin, um, and we also one of the complications we had was that the uh, the design architect was from England and did not really understand uh, the patterns of northern Arizona. Um, so. We they wrapped the building around the detention. Actually, it turned out that it was solving two problems at once. It maximizes it maximized the building's solar access, uh, gave room for this detention basin, um, so that we um, we put in a variety of uh, upland plants which were, um, were were native to that. And then we actually had a middle ground which was more of a kind of a chaparral planting. And then at the very bottom, in the bottom left corner, you can see this wet spot we actually created a wetland and then a wetland planting so we kind of three different plant zones on this project just based on the water that we had available um, they were determined to do um, a green roof on the upper right you can see this I call it a soil roof because it doesn't really four inches of of growth medium won't, won't support much of anything um, I think it's completely dead at this point since this photo was taken uh, they have to irrigate it to keep it alive that doesn't seem like a legitimate um, stormwater uh, mitigation piece to me. I think in this part of the country it should um, just put your energies under the ground or unless you're willing to put uh, at least 12 to 24 inches of soil medium up there so the thing doesn't, you know, soil temperature is probably 150 degrees in the summertime up there. So ask me a question on that later if you want more detail. Um, so we uh, other strategies we use we use the condensate from the roof to irrigate uh, swales for shade trees along the front of the building. 
Um, and generally, once we finally got um, the soil loosened up enough, because uh, one of the biggest problems on this project was the um, civil engineer, when we redid the um, uh, redid the grading, is essentially compacted um, the detention basin. So um, getting seed and plants to take, and that was extremely difficult. I would have, not, and if I knew that was going to happen, I would have intervened a little earlier so everybody understood what we were trying to do there. It's not his fault, he just didn't know what we were trying to do, I think. That's my point. Okay, Adult Center Prescott, Arizona, elevation 5,200 feet. Um, so we have uh, four seasons there. It's cold. not as cold as Flagstaff, but we it will freeze, get below freezing virtually every night. Low, lowest temperature is probably 11, 15 degrees below zero. That's the coldest night. Very unusual, though. So this was a um, um, project recently completed last summer. Um, where we working, uh, it's a demonstration project for, um, there's the two parts, I will show you the, um, the, over, the overview here. Here's existing conditions where this is how people do drainage um, in this part of Arizona where they basically, um, I don't know, it's just uh, taking the plant, uh, taking all the water away from the plantings. Um, doesn't make much sense, but that's how they do it around here or until we got involved anyway. And so here's a plan view of the project. So starting on the left hand side, which is the uphill side, we uh, developed two um, large uh, basins in this in this uh, sloped area for um, sediment collection and as well as uh, water collection to, to um, irrigate a more diverse landscape. And then you can see it overflows to the right. Traditionally, it would just go all the way across the parking lot and out the other side. Um, in this um, case we've the two blue two blue arrows are off-site water coming in underneath the adjacent street, um, and then there's a landscape uh, adjacent to that building on the top of the page, where we've uh, um, what they refer to as the rain gardens. Um, um, you know, because it doesn't rain here that much, I'm not I'm not sure that's the perfect title for this, but that's what they wanted to call it. Um, we integrated a, a rainwater harvesting tank to demonstrate active water capture that would that water was going to be devoted to irrigating a small um, uh, kitchen garden for the use of the in the kitchen the community center inside otherwise we did the uh, put these new walkways uh, up on the high ground and we basined out along all the way to the front where we could leaving some existing plants and then replanting that entire area with um, some edibles and um, some exotic um, flowering stuff and to attract pollinators and to, to grow a little bit of food and make habitat. It's essentially what that was for. And then on the right hand side, the where the blue arrows leading off the site, we essentially put in a series of detention uh, basins to slow the water down, soak it into and um, hit uh, bedrock within a few feet. Um, so we actually had to put some soil back in these basins. We never ended up having the depth where we could do a bottom drain. We weren't sure that made sense anyway. Um, but that gets well planted and plants doing most of the remediation work in this project. So here's some of the uh, few images from there. We have to, to clad a lot of the, um, the slopes to, to make sure that when the thing does inundate, as you can see on the bottom right, that it doesn't wash our walkway or our, um, our plantings or the soil away. Very dense soil here again. I had my way to do it over again, I'd over X the whole thing and exchange lots of the soil, but did not have that luxury. All right, final case study um, in Tucson, elevation, was it 12 or 1,500 feet above sea level? Uh, maybe, maybe it's more than that, maybe it's more like 2,000 feet above sea level, but it's in the Sonoran Desert, and everyone who's ever been there knows what it's like. Um, this particular neighborhood, the Dunbar Springs neighborhood, this is where my um, uh, friend Brad Lancaster lives, and what I think what's so um, um, interesting about what he's done is it really remember the I show you a I showed you a slide earlier that had a curb cut um, and then a basin. He Brad actually started that. He did it first illegally, um, and because he, he wanted though he saw all this stormwater going down the street and just into the um, Santa Cruz River, which is basically a wash now, even though it used to run as an actual river years ago. Um, and so this is what uh, his neighborhood looked like. Um, it was not everybody was kept to themselves. Um, it was unpleasant, no shade, and so 
you know, 115 degree summer days. And then so by cutting curbs, allowing that moisture into the landscape, um, uh, I think, you know, he, he's growing, he's created shade um, without having to um, use city water. And all his neighbors are doing this too. I think just the most important part, uh, the lesson to be learned from what um, what Brad's doing is that um, the physical results are, are dramatic, but the um, but the uh, the ideas are being exported. And now, actually, the the city, as anyone that's familiar with um, Tucson, is that actually they're passing some very uh, very great um, stormwater, and um, um, then all commercial properties are required to, to have a water harvesting to provide 50% of their ir irrigation requirements. And it goes on from there. But anyway, Tucson's a good example of, of how some of these grassroots efforts are turning into public policy. And I think that's the, um, the power of this particular example. Um, and let's see. So yeah, there's um, Skywater is my um, rainwater harvesting company. And that's my landscape architecture company, ATBK, and Restudio is a planning, regenerative planning um, company. So, and I have anybody that's interested, I put, um, Ed, Ed Dustin Wright is my colleague, and he helped me with this show. And here's, if anyone has interested in contacting me, there it is. Um, otherwise, Brian, back to you for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Barnabas. I learned a lot. Um, it's really striking the differences between um, the amount of moisture that uh, is happening out there versus here and the concerns and the problems are are different but I think the tools that you presented especially the um, the rainwater budget is a great way to visualize um, how you might implement rainwater harvesting here um, don't have a ton of questions, and if people have questions, I do have a comment here that I'll get to in a minute. If you do have questions, please type them into the question pane on um, the control panel for for this webinar. Um, there is one comment, and I think it goes back to um, some of the differences between the fact that we have an abundance of water and that um, in your region, water conservation is a more pressing need. And I'll read the comment, and I think it, it goes back to some clarification about um, the uses of rainwater out there, and perhaps you didn't say, Barnabas, but um, uh, perhaps, um, well, let me, let me get the question because it's not going to make a lot of sense. Um, comment was, using rainwater to flush toilets is, um, in CS municipalities, I'm not sure what that may, means, but makes perfect sense as it replaces one gallon of potable water contributing to the peak flow period to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, I think the alternative that you didn't mention, Barnabas, and you can you can kind of expand on this, is um, using gray water, oh, combined sewer. Um, so if you have a combined sewer, it's replacing a gallon of potable water that you'd otherwise be sending to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, thank you, Scott. Um, I think that's in in comparison to um, using gray water. Is it not, Barnabas? Um, it's a it's a good point. If you're if you're lucky enough to, depending on the infrastructure available to your site or your property, um, uh, the the Flagstaff example I showed um, actually the landscape and um, and the toilets are actually using effluent, so they're usually treated they're using treated municipal water um, to for those uses so um, I agree I, I agree with that replaces one for the other but if I was if I was faced with um, uh, with the option it really depends on the situation yeah but it's a good point okay great um, thank you very much for that comment Scott and um, your response Barnabas uh, I'll wait another minute and uh, I, have, I have a, a, a one uh, a, a comment sure. about about the, the um, about learning or listening to people from other regions is that um, you know I think that um, I didn't to that talk that much about climate change but I think that um, even weather patterns in Vermont could be could change and that people should be maybe 
aware of how they could respond to those. And I think that's the reason that um, learning, and especially if they, and maybe people that also do work um, out of state or out of the region, then they could benefit from that. But understanding desert conditions might come in handy um, um, if you're dealing with more um, drought or sporadic weather patterns. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank everyone for attending. And Barnabas, I want to thank you for presenting. Um, as a reminder, uh, I want to let everyone know that we recorded this session and we will post it to our YouTube channel soon. Um, I have a planned next webinar for late spring on the topic of green roofs. And finally, if you have any follow-up questions or feedback, don't hesitate to contact me or Barnabas. And I want to thank everyone and have a good day. Do you have anything left to add, Barnabas? I don't know. Did anybody hear that last comment? Or just you? I'm not getting any other questions, so. Oh, okay. I think we're good. I guess that's it. I think we're good. Well, thanks a lot, Brian. Thank you, Barnabas, and have a wonderful day. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye take bye. care.